Hey everyone, Old School Pokemon here, back again with podcast episode number 15, joined by my usual co-host, Catch em All Collectibles, Dan. How are you doing tonight, Dan? Excellent, how are you? I'm doing well. I don't know, I don't know why I, uh, why I always ask you that, since we've, uh, <laughs> since we always talk beforehand, but sounds, sounds like a good, good little introduction we got going on there. Yeah. <laughs> So we'll go ahead and hop right into the questions for uh, for this week. My first question is from John G. Uh, he actually asked two questions in this in this one question. So I'll read the first one, and we can talk about that one. Then I'll go to the second one. But uh, he asks, "How often do you use the eBay delivery signature confirmation? I know it's required for products over seven hundred and fifty dollars, but I'm selling some pre order products that might have this fee." And I might, I might use this feature for uh, just to be safe, especially since I've already discounted some of the items and some of the some of these accounts are newer. I plan on letting these buyers know before I ship, and just wanted some extra thoughts. So, I normally just use signature confirmation on orders over seven hundred and fifty. What's required by eBay? Um, I guess if you if you want to include signature confirmation for that extra kind of peace of mind, it would be it's it's not that much of an additional cost. I think it's like two fifty or something like that. So depending upon what kind of value your the products that you're selling um, have, it's not it's not that substantial of a cost. But uh, I don't I don't necessarily see see the point to adding the signature confirmation unless it's something. That is um, really expensive in this case over the the eBay threshold of seven hundred and fifty dollars because I personally I've never had a situation where somebody claims that the, the uh, item was never delivered when the tracking information says it was delivered so I've never run into that situation myself um, where you do run into situations are people receiving the item, not wanting the item anymore, and then claiming it was damaged or something something along those lines. So signature confirmation isn't going to help you out at all uh, in, in those types of situations. The only, the only time signature confirmation is going to help you out is when they claim they never received the item when they, when they actually did. Um, so I've never, I've never really run into those types of situations. So I don't include it unless it's required from, by, by eBay. Uh, so that's that's what I would say on that one. Yeah, similarly for me, I've never included it when I didn't have to. Um, I think you and I both have the volume and we've we've done the business for so long. We're working with fairly large numbers, so we don't want it to happen. But say we did have a $700 loss, we can kind of absorb that hit. If you're someone who sells very infrequently and it's going to be a one-off or maybe only a couple times a year type thing, and just for the peace of mind, I, I think it is a reasonable thing to do if it'll help you sleep better at night and and potentially, yeah, being a newer account where eBay might not have as strong of uh, seller protection for you in the event of some kind of unforeseen circumstance where, where the buyer is trying to pull something or, or something just genuinely happens. So, but, but if you're doing any kind of like significant volume, three dollar two fifty to $3 per transaction across dozens of transactions a year or hundreds of transactions a year, you're much better off just kind of self-insuring. So every time that you would have bought it, mentally put that three dollars into an account somewhere put that into a basket in your mind and then every 100 transactions or if you have an issue like okay well it's kind of balancing out there but yeah that's kind of my answer generally don't use it if you've got the volume or the total sales amount to kind of just uh self-insure there uh and then if, it, if it's a really infrequent thing, though, and the peace of mind is worth it for you, yeah, go ahead. It, it's not going to hurt anything. Yeah, exactly. And then the second part of this question, or his second question, would be also, do you use eBay PWE with tracking for booster packs under $20? 
I've started to sell some Japanese packs, and it's the only option that makes sense. However, if the order has three or more packs, do I do first class mailing with tracking? Uh, can't wait for the next episode. Well, thank you for your continued support there. Glad you glad you uh, enjoy these these podcasts. But uh, to answer that question for you, I actually I would definitely use PWB with tracking on on single booster packs. I don't I don't actually sell single booster packs myself, but. Uh, I usually I usually sell them in art sets uh, just because it's it's more so worthwhile. But um, on a single booster pack, if you're selling single Japanese booster packs, especially Japanese booster packs, but even even English booster packs, um, single packs, I would definitely do the eBay uh, PWE with tracking. Just make sure you set it to three ounces. Um, that way, that way, it's classified as non-machinable. Because if you do if you do just a single ounce, it's going to go machinable and uh, it's probably going to end up getting ruined, but uh, I would I would just do um, for for packaging. I always used to do a I don't know the correct term card saver or semi rigid, <laughs> but uh, either either uh, whatever whatever you want to call them card savers or semi rigids. Uh, I would always put the pack inside the semi rigid and then seal it closed with a with a top loader. Uh, that's that's always how I used to store my booster packs. And so I'd, I'd ship them out the same way if I were you. And then once you get into three or more Japanese packs um, or even like two English packs where, where Japanese packs have less cards, uh, I would definitely do first class mail with tracking uh, just because of the, the thickness. Uh, you, you, you kind of, it, your chances of having something damaged with uh, such a thick PWE package increases. Um, so I would, I would definitely do first class mail with tracking when you're talking three or more Japanese packs or even two or more English packs. Yeah, for me, it's been a long time since I've sold, I guess I do sell the occasional single pack, but it's like a multi hundred dollar pack generally. Um, so I don't really have any insight on shipping like under twenty dollar things. I, I've still not sold a single item with the um, the tracked PWE that eBay newly offers. So yeah, that's more of a Nick question. I think he covered it. <laughs> um, John G actually came over to to my channel to ask another question. So I know as sellers we take on most of the risk, but at what point do you not refund? fight the claim or tell the buyer to file for USPS insurance claim. Um, even with PWE standard tracking and selling something like five to $19 in value, do you always take the loss if the buyer says it's not arrived? And at what, what cost point do you not accept that loss? So again, I don't really do this now. I do all that through Troll and Toad Evo. <laughs> but when I did do it, that was before tracking was even a thing. Anything plain white envelope early on before I had the experience or the knowledge of, of kind of going through the issues. I used to try to fight people and just say like, no, it definitely arrived, escalated to eBay and lose everyone. <laughs> so then it got to the point where I quickly realized I refund them. It cost me money and it annoys me, but it, it saves me headaches. Uh, but yeah, as of right now, it, it's not something I deal with. So I think I think Nick might have a better answer again here. So that's a tricky one. Um, I was talking with someone a couple weeks ago about this this situation. So PWE with tracking, um, we've talked about this before, but the tracking information isn't that accurate. So it, the the tracking information says it's delivered when the or when the package reaches the final main sorting facility. So it says delivered. It's not actually delivered 99% of the time. And then a day or two later, it actually shows up and is delivered. Um, so there is an issue with the tracking information with the standard envelope with tracking. However, the whatever, whatever, platform eBay uses for those for those types of orders um, the seller is covered up to up to twenty dollars so up to the cost of the most expensive item you can send through that service um, as a as as a type of some type of insurance so 
if you do run into these situations, you can um, make an insurance claim through whatever platform eBay uses. Um, however, the item does have to say that it is delivered. I uh, can't just sometimes sometimes you'll run into a circumstance where there's no updates with these with these packages. Uh, in that case, you won't you won't be able to fight. Um, you won't be able to you won't be able to fight and get your get your insurance claim for for whatever reason. It actually it actually has to say delivers for you to file and possibly win an insurance claim. I've actually never never tried to do this because there's there's a lot of stipulations. You have to you have to wait. It's either thirty or sixty days for your for the package to say delivered. Um, and then there's there's a few other stipulations that I forget. So it's it's just seems it seems to be like a huge hassle with minimal upside to it. So on a on a PWE order, I always just I always just take the loss. Um, but then again, like Dan mentioned in the earlier question, uh, both of us are doing fairly fairly substantial volumes, so we're able to take that loss. Um, more so than someone who's just selling a couple items here and there on eBay. So um, I would I would look into that if I were you. Um, it, it sounds like it would be a hassle because you do have to keep track of all those all those tracking numbers, file them after thirty or sixty days or whatever it is. Um, but you could possibly win those insurance claims. Um, <clears throat> and then the only the only other thing I would mention is. The, the uh, working with the buyers on an item not received case is one of the one of the most important things for top rated seller status on eBay. Like those those selling metrics, um, you have a you have a fairly wide margin for all of the other metrics except for the item not received or item not as described. Uh, you can you can only have a few of those a few of those cases. If you want to be, if you want to be top rated seller status, or I'm sorry, you can you can have as many of those cases as possible. You have to resolve them as a seller. You can't let them go to you can't let them go to eBay. So that's another reason why I just basically automatically refund is because I want to maintain that top rated seller status um, versus possibly making a couple extra bucks here and there. However, when you get into um, when you get into higher value items, so like first class, priority mail, stuff like that, that that's when that's when it changes for me. So I would say anything anything over fifty dollars, I would say I would look into more so, um, just because it it for me, knock on wood, it really never happens. Um, I can count on like one hand the number of times that. I've had a first class or priority or whatever, whatever mail class. Um, someone say that they never received the item, the item got damaged in transit or something, something along those lines. So it really never happens. The only, the only time you really have to worry about it is with that, with these PWE orders, uh, at least, at least from my, my personal experience. So hopefully, hopefully that rambling answer answered your question there. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think the post office gets kind of a bad rap, but Generally speaking, I mean, I've sent, I think I have like 17,000 feedback because back in the day I did more like what you're doing now, 200, 300, 300 items a week, a lot of plain white envelope, uh, not many issues over the years, several thousand, 10,000 plus shipments from plain white envelope up to priority. And I mean, the post office is pretty, pretty good, solid. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> So my second question is from Matthew B. He asks, do you guys think there will be a way to snipe listings in the upcoming October PWCC auction block or any future PWCC auction blocks? I used to snipe PWCC auctions on eBay, but that's not feasible anymore. Um, so I've actually, I actually haven't looked at the PWCC um, website and their their own auction blocks now that they're now that they're off eBay. Um, so I'm gonna pass this one right along to Dan and hopefully hopefully he has an answer for you. Yeah so PWCC um, similar to eBay they have like the proxy bidding where you can put in put in your maximum bid at any point throughout the auction and they'll bid on your behalf 
up to your maximum bid. They won't bid you up to your maximum bid without, I mean, they'll, they'll bid to stay ahead of the second highest bidder by one increment similarly, uh, similarly to eBay. But one thing that they explicitly state on their website, you can't use like Gixon. There's no third party sniping software that you can use on PWCC. Um, and they also have like eBay, you can go on eBay right now and you can look at an auction. It has a specific exact end time. So what people will do is they'll use Gixon. Hey, put in my maximum bid one to three seconds before it ends, snipe it. Um, that's not a thing with PWCC because each individual item doesn't have an exact end time. The way that it works, I actually, before we started, I, I pulled it up to be 100% sure, but yeah, there's like a 60 second e extension every time a new bid is placed. So it's kind of like an anti-sniping feature built in. In some ways, I guess it's, I mean, as someone consigning items to PWCC, it is a positive thing is like, okay, nobody's going to win on a last second snipe because they had a hundred tabs open and they can't uh, get, get to it in time or whatever. So it, it, it's a positive more for like the people selling through it. But yeah, as the buyers, theoretically, that would serve to like make sure prices are realizing what they, what they truly would. So yeah, if you're, if you're looking to snipe and get deals through that way, sniping is not a thing on PWCC, but I, I believe this October block, which is going to be taking off in about a week or so, I think it's mid October, they go live. I heard it's several thousand cards and it's not going to have the eyes that eBay does. I don't think you're really going to need to snipe and there might be some deals out there. So I know I'm going to be there. I was never one to snipe on eBay. I always just put in my max bid whenever I found the auction, whether there was five seconds left or five days left, I'd just put it in my max and then be done with it. Um, and that's the way I'm going to do it again now over at PWCC. So yeah, I think that's everything on that. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the first lot at PWCC to see how that goes. I'm, I'm going to be ready to shop and hopefully get some deals, but I am selling some stuff too. So I hope the deals aren't like too crazy. I didn't sell anything really big though on there. I, um, I'm just doing 50 to a hundred dollar cards or so a handful of them. Didn't they, did, did they not have a September block? Nope. They had the premiere oh, still. They, they had the premiere still for, for September, but this, oh, okay. this is going to be like the first of their standard monthly auctions, like like we were used to on eBay. Okay, okay. <clears throat> it, whether it's going to be one day of Pokemon or whether it'll be spread across three, kind of by era like it was at the end in um, July and August, I, I don't really know yet. That might be public. That might be stated somewhere. I, I'm not entirely sure, though. Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how because I, I thought they did one but um show so, so much i pay attention <laughs> but um it'll be interesting to see how that that first block does yeah yeah i'm definitely like excited for it pricing pricing that uh pricing that goes goes through the their website versus on ebay yeah definitely <clears throat> so our next question comes from shiny light bulb 1000 and it's our first metazoo question <laughs> for for the podcast i yeah. believe I, I think we've talked about it a little bit here and there but this is the first viewer question regarding it so could you speak on the volatility of the metazoo market or maybe just volatile markets in general i know you spoke a bit about this on your metazoo box break a specific example is that about a month ago i bought a metazoo spell book for 125 dollars and the lowest price today on ebay is 250 I was planning on collecting a spell book per MetaZoo set going forward, but these kind of price jumps really freak me out. <laughs> so yeah, MetaZoo has been pretty wild lately. Um, anyone following my channel, I, I picked up some Kickstarter boxes earlier in the summer, a little bit below like two grand. Kickstarter boxes are eight to 10,000 now, I think. Um, Cryptid Nation first edition, is 
what are we at? 900 bucks, almost a thousand. Nick and I, I, I think you picked up a little bit. I, I picked up several boxes at around 450 bucks. Um, Nightfall pre-orders. I locked in a couple potentially if they don't cancel on me at 250 a box. And those are up over 300 now. I think MetaZoo is just, it's born in a crazy time. We've got the pandemic. We've got everything that sports and Pokemon and crypto and housing and the stock market have done over the past year, year and a half. Everything is just going crazy. And relatively speaking, the MetaZoo print runs are like nothing compared to Pokemon or Magic, Yu-Gi-Oh, anything like that. Obviously, MetaZoo doesn't have anywhere near the reach either, but... When you've got 2,500 Kickstarter boxes, 25,000 first edition uh, Cryptid Nation boxes, it's just like a few big players with decent bankrolls can really move the needle. They can really move the numbers big time. So, yeah, I mean, Pokemon in general, trade uh, collect collectibles like Pokemon cards like MetaZoo, they're inherently illiquid, speculative, and volatile so something like metazoo how small it is it just really cranks up that volatility by a factor of 10 and that's not something that's going to change anytime too soon i don't think it i'm really interested to see beyond nightfall the next intended um release is going to be the second edition of cryptid nation i'm really interested to see what that does how and if it affects first edition and Kickstarter edition of Cryptid Nation. Um, me personally, I genuinely like the product. I genuinely think the whole Cryptid idea is pretty cool. I think that pretty much everyone in the world knows a Cryptid or two local to them. And then there are some of the big ones that almost everyone knows about. I mean, Bigfoot we had in the first set. And so it's, it's really interesting to see where it's going to go. And it's going to be a wild ride for at least the short to intermediate term, I think. It, it's going to stay very volatile. So uh, buckle up. <laughs> yeah, I would I would agree with you there. Um, the, the one area we differ is I, I got to open some more packs. Because I really, I really opened, I opened one Kickstarter pack and uh, I, I really wasn't a big fan of it. Uh, so I'm I am purchasing a little bit of Mezu. I actually got it right there in the background. Um, <laughs> just just collecting dust right now, but I, I'm more so doing it in case it does become something to make money off of it. In terms of like actual interest, I don't I don't really I don't really see it. I don't I don't have that much much actual interest in in Metazoo, uh myself. But then again, I've only ever opened that one pack. I've never never really looked too too much into it um so maybe maybe i just have to spend spend more time looking at it but um i, I think what you said is really interesting too because like I, being completely honest and transparent about it i can't say that like the thought of making a bunch of money on it isn't part of the reason i mean that's definitely part of the reason that i'm buying into it and you and i both did really well over the past year to year and a half with Pokemon, right? And there's a lot of guys like us who similarly did that. So again, given how small it is, when all the hype is there and people see the potential to 10X or, or maybe more, who knows? You get a lot of people who don't even necessarily like it. Like it, it's so easy to take, I'm going to take a grand that I made on Pokemon last year and buy a box and throw it in my closet and maybe it'll be five grand in, in a couple of years and maybe it'll be zero. But like, there's a lot of people just buying into it solely for the hype. The same way, I mean, that was common in Pokemon last year too. So sorry to cut in, but yeah, I think. Oh no, you're good. Your your like mentality, your your feelings about it, why you're into it. That's an extremely common sentiment. And again, given how small these print runs are, if there's a thousand people like you who, yeah, I'm just going to buy a couple boxes of each you're looking at 10 to 20% of the print run being gone. I mean, yep. that's massive. Yeah, that was that was going to be my next point is uh, <clears throat> how many 
how many people we we've talked about this before but how many people are actually interested in metazoo they like opening the packs they like collecting the cards they like playing the games versus how many people are just in from into metazoo for the reasons like like what i said just exclusively to buy the product at one point flip it to make make more money uh, <laughs> i i personally think there's a lot more people who are in it for that than a legitimate genuine interest but then um, I, I recently figured out how to get on the MetaZoo Discord, <laughs> <laughs> and um, there there are a decent amount of people on the Discord who actually love MetaZoo. They're constantly talking about all this merch that MetaZoo's drop in. They're talking about how to build decks. Uh, they're talking about the artwork of the cards. So there is at least a portion of people who have a genuine interest in MetaZoo, um, which I, fo I found kind of surprising myself when I was, when I was looking through that discord, but um, so that, that, that's a good sign for the hobby, but I, I, I am really curious as to how many, how many people are actually interested in MetaZoo versus just interested in the money behind MetaZoo. Um, that's, that's, that's one, that's my biggest concern uh, right now with MetaZoo is I think I personally think it's more so people who are just looking to make money in MetaZoo versus those who have a who have a genuine interest in the in the longevity of the game. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's hard to say. Um but it's uh it's been a wild ride the few months I've been into it and I I genuinely enjoy enjoyed opening the packs. I mean it's interesting to me. It's intriguing the whole idea of cryptids would I buy it at a thousand dollars a box solely for like the enjoyment? No, I mean, I wouldn't buy Evolving Skies at 180 either. Like, that's so. I mean, I'm buying it because I see opportunity. I, it's a very risky play, but I mean, money can only go down to zero, but it can 10x. So, it, if you take a certain amount of kind of gambles in that respect, if one or two of them pay off, you can, uh, I mean, you can still make out overall. So it, do, it does have a lot of good things going for it. All the, like the tops part or tops collaboration they did, they're doing all this, all this merch. So they, they're definitely building a good, a good foundation. Um, so it could definitely become something one, one of these days. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see if it if it does ever ever take off yeah yeah i did get some of the tops boxes um i know right at release the top site went down which i think it does like daily for whatever they're releasing throughout for sports stuff and whatever but it went down and then i checked the discord and people were like oh i can't do anything i just like left it alone i didn't go crazy spending a bunch of time trying to get it to go through like an hour, hour and a half later, I just hopped on. I threw 10 into my cart. I bought them. And I'm like, wow, I can't believe that just went through so easy. I look at the Discord. There was like one or two other people who had posted. They had luck. And then a, tons of people who were like still since an hour prior trying to check out with no luck. I, I think I just got really lucky somehow. Um, but I, the tops thing, I think it's pretty interesting. It, it's kind of... It's more along the sports lines, right? Like it's got the one of 99s, the one of 250s, whatever, the sketch cards. And I mean, it's got certain things going on that some people would love to see come to Pokemon and some people would hate to see come to Pokemon. I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of people talk about, I mean, Topps Chrome has been really big lately. It's done really well through all this. The Spectra, Sparkle, uh, Techno variants. I've seen people talk about yeah, I don't want the TCG to get into the to the numbered things. But if Tops were to come along and, and do a Pokemon set and do the one out of 10s, one out of 99, whatever, numbered, signed. I mean, I've seen people interested in that. So so for MetaZoo to have that, pretty interesting. Interesting to see where it's all going to go. Um, yeah, they're, they're, de they're definitely doing a lot of the right things. They're, they're listening to kind of the complaints people have or have have or had with Pokemon and kind of uh 
fixing fixing those in terms of like actual print numbers that's a that's a big one for us and then uh the actual like not having all these like really really obscure variants that we don't know don't know where they came from uh it sounds like sounds like metazoo's gonna gonna have like specific releases for for everything which will which will be nice like instead of just doing first edition and unlimited they're gonna be doing like different different types of print runs so that, i think that'll be good so they're, they're definitely doing a lot of the right things <clears throat> Yeah, and, and we were talking a little bit before we came on, but I think each set is going to have its own kind of unique little thing. So for the Kickstarter boxes, I think they just had like a map in there, like the cryptid map that showed you the, the United States and where each cryptid came from. Uh, cryptid Nation first edition had the box toppers. One out of 250 chance you could pull that red ink card which is pretty cool. And I guess Nightfall, it's not going to have box toppers, but there's this speculation that it might be God Pack, Secret Rare, something like that. Um, they kind of, like every Friday, they drop a new spoiler. They drop a new new card from the next set. And I've been following along the Discord for a few weeks now. And it's it, it's definitely interesting and kind of fun, just all the hype, all the speculation it's cool to kind of be seeing it and be experiencing it from, from, well, I didn't, I didn't like fund the Kickstarter. So not from day one, not from day zero, but like from early on. Cause one thing I, I, I constantly, well, not constantly, but one thing I occasionally will think back is like, man, I was into Pokemon at the start, at least the start of the Eng English releases. Imagine if I had just stayed in it. For, for the whole thing. Like imagine if I had been here 25 years deep. Imagine if I had just been here through it all. Think of all the things I would have from over the years. I mean, um, if MetaZoo becomes a real thing, goes for five, 10, 20 years, I mean, you could be a part of it from the start, right? That's kind of an interesting idea. To, oh yeah, definitely. To think about that. And so, yeah, it's, it's new, it's interesting, exciting, it's crazy like everything else is these days. Uh, one thing I, I saw that's pretty interesting too is like, so Kickstarter was kind of the launch, the initial funding for MetaZoo. There's been a lot of other card games coming through. I, I've seen some talked about in different discords, and but I think there's like a lot of card games trying to launch off of the success of like what MetaZoo did. Um, so there's people, there's people funding Kickstarters of new card games, tr hoping it's going to be the next MetaZoo. And it's definitely uh, a lot of speculation, a lot of volatility out there to, to just go back to the, to the question. Um, but in a way, like, I mean, that, that gets articles written that, that, that puts eyes on it. That makes people notice it. Again, going back to the whole cryptid thing, everyone knows some amount of cryptids. Everyone's got those local urban legends, mythical creatures, whatever lore. Uh, it's an intriguing thing. <laughs> did you did you know the term cryptid before MetaZoo, though? Nope. I, I had never heard of that term. <laughs> I had never heard the term, but like once I heard it, I mean, I looked it up and it's like, oh, yeah, I mean, I, I can like I, I know of several cryptids. Oh yeah, 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 no, uh, definitely. Yeah, before not having known what cryptid meant, but it's yeah, it's it's interesting. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, I think I think we thoroughly answered that question. Yeah. <laughs> Don't want to turn into a MetaZoo podcast, right? <laughs> I I almost wore my shirt again. I wore my MetaZoo shirt the other night at, to to kind of meme on the <laughs> on Swami's uh what was that called top spec top spec yeah that was fun so yeah and anyone who's watching now and you didn't see that go over to swami's channel just to kind of shout him out he had us on the other night that was a, a a fun time on there nick and i were both on there as as guests of his channel that was that was a good time those those are those are fun yeah. and uh swami if you're watching definitely definitely keep those up those are those are a great idea yeah and thanks for thanks for having us on there um, so my next question, or I guess it, next, next question or next topic, um, some, some, some weirdo 
who who spells his name wrong, spells collectibles wrong. <laughs> um, let us let us know in the chat. How do you spell collectibles? You spell it uh, T A B L E S or T I B L E S. <laughs> but uh, uh, no, um, catch them all collectibles. Dan uh, left a comment on on my my last podcast for me to uh, me to talk about consignments, uh, which I recently got into. Super super excited about that. So I. It kind of, kind of just happened. I've been thinking about it for a long time. Uh, I remember getting off my ship back last November and going on Swami's channel for my very first interview. And back then, I told him that I was going to be planning to go full time with eBay. Uh, we were talking about different avenues that I would start to get into. And even back then, I had mentioned in that interview that I wanted to get into eBay consignments. So basically selling stuff on eBay for other people. Um, and it just, just never, never worked out. I never, never had the time to actually do it until just recently. Um, one of my, one of my Instagram friends actually reached out saying that he had some cards he wanted to sell. Um, at the time, Rusty was on vacation, so he couldn't, couldn't send them to Rusty, which worked out, worked out well in my favor. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so he sent them, he sent the cards to me for consignment and that kind of, kind of launched my, uh, launched my consignment services. Um, I'm going to be doing, uh, anything, anything through consignment is going to be via eBay auction for right now. Uh, I might, might change it at some point to, to doing buy it nows or auction, but, uh, for right now, just for simplicity's sake, it's all going to be either a seven day auction or a 10 day auction. They're all going to end on a Sunday night, which I, I think is the best time to end, a, end an eBay auction. So uh, they're either gonna start on Sunday or a, uh, or a Thursday to end on Sunday. And um, if you, uh, any of you guys are interested in consigning through me, definitely reach out via Instagram or email. Uh, I always leave that in the, in the description below, but yeah, so far I had my first one that just ended yesterday and worked out really well. We, uh, we got some good prices on the cards that he sent me. Um, we actually still have one more. There was a slight issue with one of the, uh, one of the consignments there, but we worked that one out and, uh, it's actually the, the PSA eight first edition Charizard, um, is up on, up on my eBay auction right now. But the other cards ended up selling good. Uh, got some good prices on those. And if any of you guys are interested, feel free to reach out. Um, like I said, Instagram, email. Um, get your get your cards shown in a YouTube video, uh, an Instagram story, and post it on eBay. But yeah, that's that's about that's about what I got to say for that. Um, and then you will see some you will be seeing some other consignment videos uh, coming up on my channel, probably probably next week. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I actually did get my second two consignments after, after the initial one, which is awesome. Super, super happy about that. So hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to get a few more and, uh, kind of do this semi, semi regularly. <clears throat> I don't know. I don't think I'll ever get as big as a uh, PWCC or anything like that, but, uh, <laughs> be, be nice to, uh, be able to do it semi consistently for sure. And your plan is to do those on a weekly basis too, right? Like it's not certain Sundays every month. It's every Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh, basically is uh, whenever consignments come in, I'll get them listed that Sunday, unless they show up like Saturday or something. But basically, but if they show up at the end of the week, I'll get them listed, start them on Sunday. And uh, you'll basically get paid whenever the buyer pays and I actually ship the item out. So you don't have to don't have to worry about anything getting returned or anything like that. Just whenever whenever I get the money, you get paid, and uh, we call it good. And then you take over. Like, I mean, hopefully it's not too frequent of a thing. But if things get returned down the line, if things get damaged in the mail, that's you're you're taking over the order fulfillment, right? Customer service. Yeah. One that. one thing I have been doing so for these consignments is normally I offer free shipping on everything. For the consignments, I have been charging shipping, and I basically, um, so I charge shipping, uh, and I add insurance onto every single thing that sells, just to 
add that extra layer of protection. Um, so that way, if something does get lost in the mail or damaged in transit, it's not, I'll be able to get that money back eventually, um, hopefully. So I have been, I have been doing that to kind of, kind of cover myself, but yeah, any, anything that goes wrong, I, uh, I take the hit on that. So that's definitely a huge perk. If you're looking to sell stuff without, uh, without actually having to take the hit yourself. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I feel like I've talked about it. I forget if it was with you or just in one of my ramblings in one of my videos, but, uh, I think there's a lot of people on the hobby who just buy and collect and, and they don't really sell. They don't really have a way to sell. They don't have any idea of an exit plan. And then sometimes like life will happen to those people. Car breaks down, water heater goes, they decide to get married or buy a house or have kids and whatever. Um, so I think the service is great for people who like don't have an eBay or maybe they have an eBay, they only sell a little bit here and there, but they're just uncomfortable with the higher, larger numbers. Uh, I, I definitely think it's a great service. Um, one thing too, that I think next year, and we've, we've definitely talked about this, the whole 1099 thing. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, I'm not adver advocating for it, but like just <laughs> knowing how things work and, and what certain people are going to do. I mean, certain people are going to find attractiveness in consigning through people to not get that 1099 in their name. Um, so that's definitely just a reality of, of something moving ahead that, that people, people will be using the service for. So it, it definitely has a lot of different benefits for people. Um, one thing you're doing too that's kind of unique as far as I am aware, a lot of people have like a flat fee, right? Yours is kind of a scaling thing. As the numbers get bigger, the commission percentage drops. Yep, yep. So, so yep. you charge like the actual fees and then depending on what bracket it ends in, it's like a different percentage, right? Yeah, so I do, basically you're, you're going to pay the eBay fees, which is... Usually it's around 11.5% between the final value fee and the managed payment fee. Um, so you'll pay, you'll pay that portion. And then depending upon the actual ending price of that item, uh, it's going to be anywhere between 10% all the way down to 2.5%. Uh, so like for the, I had one, like my first consignment, um, there was a PSA 10 unlimited base set Charizard that sold for 10,900 bucks. Uh, I only took two and a half percent for myself. And then the, the uh, person who consigned it paid the eBay fees. But in, in total, he ended up getting, I think it was $10,200. So all the, all the fees, my commission, uh, the shipping, all that stuff ended up being like, what's that? Like seven, 700 bucks. So it's it's really not bad at all. Um, when you when you get to that that higher value stuff, um, and then with the lower value stuff, it ranges between ten percent, five percent, all the way down to two and a half percent. Like I said, mm. yeah, and that's kind of a unique model. I think most like PWCC is just a percentage. It it is a scaling percentage as the number goes up, it goes down, but like it doesn't get anywhere near. The two and a half percent. I, I, I guess it, it's different because it's they're not charging you the fee plus, right? So it, it, it's definitely yeah. Different. So it, it it's it's uh it's like twelve and a half percent. Um, or I guess I guess it's a little bit less because once once you get into that higher value stuff, I'm paying less of a fee to eBay as well. Um, but yeah, so it, it's it's the eBay fees plus what so whatever I pay for the eBay fee is plus two and a half percent on top of that. That that is true because yeah, the PWCC fee never capped. You're you're gonna you're gonna pass okay. on that cap to people, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yep. when you're when yeah, when they're paying the actual eBay fees at the really high end, that fee caps. So then it'll just be two and a half percent plus the the capped fee. So yeah, yeah interesting exactly. thing. Oh yeah, definitely. I went over to your channel to ask the question so that you didn't feel like uh, you didn't want to 
advertise for yourself on our podcast, but I was, I, I'm fine with that. And I think it's definitely an interesting and useful service for potentially many of our viewers. So I wanted to, to chat about that. Oh, well, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate that. And yeah, I'll do a, um, once I, once I, this was, this was kind of a good test run for consignments where it's someone that I've done business with and I know well. So we've been able to go back and forth on, on Instagram a lot and kind of, kind of talk about the, the whole consignment services. So I've, I've been able to kind of fine tune it a little bit. And so for the, the next consignment video that I do, I'll actually have some, uh, some like, I'll put some, uh, nice little tables in the video to actually give you my exact rates and, uh, and all of that stuff. So you will be seeing more consignment talks from, from me on my channel. So if you don't like those videos, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, uh, I'll definitely get a little batch over to you just to try out the service and maybe I'll, uh, maybe I'll make a review video testing it out see how it goes yeah i heard uh i heard you send some stuff to james before me <laughs> he had the service launched before you <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i uh you better treat me right because i don't want to have to tear you up in a bad review on my youtube <laughs> got some pretty big pretty big viewer base pretty big pull over here yeah yeah <laughs> All, all your subscribers already know me because they, they, <laughs> <laughs> they came through the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, what do you want to talk about next? Got some, got some exciting news. I guess we'll do that last, right? You want to do the trolling? Oh, troll we, we can save the best for the last. We yeah, can, we we'll save that. the best for the last. Um, that way people don't. People don't leave early. They stick around <laughs> to the end. Um, so yeah, I, I made my own video. We're actually recording this on Monday. Generally, we record these on Wednesdays. You'll still be seeing this Thursday. But earlier today, Monday, I, I did a video on my channel about Troll and Toad Evo's price increases. I don't think it's as relevant for Nick, but <laughs> it... Um, <laughs> pretty relevant to me. They, across the board, they increase prices for just about everything. Um, raw fulfillment went from six cents per card to 10 cents per card. A-list raw fulfillment, like where they break modern packs for you, that went from two cents each to six cents each. So that tripled, that's significant. Um, what, one thing that went up substantially, uh, the return item fee, so they used to charge you six cents per item, like per line item. So if you sent back like a thousand versus seekers, just a random trainer, a thousand or whatever, it would literally just be six cents plus the shipping fee. Now it's six cents per item. So if you were to send back a thousand versus seekers, that's $60, which to me feels like that's a lot. If it's 1,000 different singles, like literally 1,000 different, that would take forever to pull. And I think it would be reasonable to pay $60, which is what the old fee would be. If you have 1,000 different cards, that's 1,000 different lines. That would be 60 bucks under the new fee or the old fee. But under the new fee, it's $60 to send even 1,000 of the same item. So what I did is I reached out to them. I emailed them, hey... This is kind of catching me off guard. I've been eyeing some things to kind of pull back eventually anyways. Can I, can I get like one shipment within the next week at the old rates? And they're great over there. They said, yeah, sure. So I pulled back like 10,000 cards roughly. Um, and they were mostly like versus seekers, level balls, uh, Rayquaza EXs. Ma mainly the things that I got from that, uh, the Rayquaza Keldeo Ballerina decks. Have have those Rayquazas been selling well for you? TCG player, they have. Okay. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> yeah, I, have, I have not been having much luck on eBay with those. I thought those things would sell out immediately. I still have a good portion of what I started with. I think I called back 400 of them. <laughs> I, I had, I had like... 600 or 700 i don't even remember i, I think i had 350 decks broken down i had I think a lot. It was two in each deck anyway so yeah 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 i had a lot and i still have a lot but they are 
they are selling better on TCG player. That's part of the reason I call them back one, because like with that new rate in effect, certain items are just like they're locked there forever because Mm -hmm. you can't pull back a 20 cent single paying six cents each. You may as well just because on a 20 cent single, the fee is 50%. So you get 10 cents from it. If you're paying six cents to pull that back, you may as well just sell it to them bulk for three cents. (laughs) So that's actually something I'm going to do in the next week or two as well. Um, They will allow you to do like Evo to bulk. So you just send them a spreadsheet and you say like, Hey, I want to bulk out. And they don't charge you like six cents per item for that. They just, they take them into bulk or they probably pay you bulk. And then they probably like keep them in their own inventory to sell them singles. I don't really know how it works, but that's, that's something I'm going to be doing moving ahead too, is like doing a decent batch of, there's probably five to 10,000 cards. I can just bulk, um, I'm still not to where like I'm paying storage fees because of my credit that I get, but I, I would I would wait and just hold everything until uh or the the stuff that you want to keep there. Just yeah. wait until you reach a point where you have to pay storage fees, then start looking into bulking stuff out. There's been a couple months where like I've barely crossed over the the so like my storage fee, I'm I'm over a hundred dollars under the credit limit that I get. But my concern is like one of these months, I might miss the the sales threshold, mm-hmm. um, which they've asked me to not share the specific numbers, but like I've kind of pretty said pretty closely what it is. Um, so yeah, my concern is that I'll miss, I'll miss that goal. And then boom, I'll have a, a hundred couple hundred dollar storage fee for a month that i just don't want to end up having so mm-hmm. I'll, I'll trim down the inventory i i've got thousands of 20 cent trainers that there are a thousand listed that aren't ever selling i mean <laughs> it, it's worth just i think i have like well energies came in those decks so i have like thousands of energies there too and i'm talking th- the hollow ones actually slowly sell for the 20 cents a piece Mm-hmm. but like water energies they're not going to sell for 20 cents a piece so i just got to bulk yep. those out for a cent a piece and get rid of them <laughs> yeah exactly exactly <laughs> but yeah that evo kind of big news for anybody who uses it kind of big news for people who buy on it too i actually had some people reach out to me who are like yeah i don't sell through it i don't care i'm never going to sell through it but a, a big thing from like the buyer side is foreign Pokemon singles under $40, they're not going to take them and do them anymore. So like I, I had somebody reach out to me who said like, yeah, I, I, I fill out all my Japanese modern binders buying like 20, 50 cent singles from them. That's not going to be a thing anymore. Moving ahead. Like what's there is grandfathered in and it can stay there, but moving ahead, they're not going to take it in. So I wonder why they would do... I can see, like, <clears throat> like uh, Portuguese, whatever. What did I can't even... French, Dutch, all those languages. Uh, but why Japanese? Because Japanese is such a huge part of Pokemon. You would, you'd think they'd want to keep Japanese. I was really surprised that they didn't do two things. I was surprised that English and Japanese were both allowed. Like, getting... Yeah, shedding off the, the lesser ones... But I was also surprised base wasn't exempted because like that's true, yeah. I actually I, I'm kicking myself now because I didn't do it, but like I opened one of every base set first edition box aside from English <laughs> <laughs> over the years. And like I actually I mean I, I have some PSA nine Korean Charmanders that I graded that were selling for like two hundred bucks a piece and some random PSA 10 like I graded the starters only maybe down the line I'll have to grade a lot more of those like even the non-starters but like what I was gonna do some of those sell on eBay for 10 20 bucks because like just not many people are selling them I didn't really want to do 10 20 singles on my eBay I was gonna send them all into tro- troll and toad and just price them like in the 10 plus I'm, I have thousands of those across all languages Mm-hmm. that's like a fairly significant amount of money, but now I can't send them anymore because they're, 
because they're non they're non English under forty bucks. So yeah, that kind of stinks. Um, I guess I'm gonna have to go through them, see what's gradable. Once PSA has a sub ten twenty dollar grading fee, maybe I can grade more of them. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that that's definitely tough. I think I can see some of these increases with Troll and Toad, like the uh, the raw fulfillment um, makes sense to me. The opening packs make sense to me. Um, getting stuff returned, though, I I still I still don't like how much they're charging for that. I think that's a ridiculous amount to charge, even even if someone goes through and says i want one of each copy of this card that i have there and i have a thousand different cards i want you to send um that that's 60 dollars. it doesn't take say the i don't know what the minimum wage down in kentucky is but up, up here in mass it's 15 bucks an hour so that's four hours of of work to get a 60 dollar um price price tag um it, it, it does not take six or four hours to pull a thousand cards i think it does i can't i find that very hard to believe I, I so i have i have about 3200 line items if i if i told them i wanted to do one of everything that i have that would be about 200 dollars. i i do not think one person does that in a day in an eight hour shift i i don't think one person 3,000 individual cards, and I have only Pokemon. Mm -hmm. There might be some people that have magic. They do MetaZoo now. Like you, you could, I could have 300 each of 10 different TCG CCGs. I, I guess, I, I guess you have to look at how big they are too. Like, like, like for me, everything's in one room. Yeah. So I'm moving from this box to this box. They have so that, a hundred, that's true too. They're, hundred they're plus walking. thousand square foot warehouse. I don't know how it's all set up, but like they, yeah. I mean, base set singles could be like a hundred feet down the aisle from Vivid Voltage and, and uh, Evolving Skies and stuff. Like, yeah, that that I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. Even if it's all in the same. Like, cause you and me, we have like, well, like, look at Mason, look at Mason's shop. He has like a monster box for each set. Mm -hmm. They might have 20 monster boxes for some sets. They might have, like, I would love to see inside there and, and see how it works. Um, one question that you had actually asked me this week and a couple other people reached out to me and asked um, over, over the past months, but like when, when I send a card, so if I, like I have right now, I have 30 Hidden Fates ETBs and I probably have a handful of the, the Charizard promos. So those 30 Hidden Fates ETBs, if I were to recall those, I wouldn't necessarily get the same exact 30 ETBs I sent in. So when you send in cards that are cheap or when you send in items like that, they get pooled together. So Troll and Toad might have a thousand Hidden Fates ETBs in their warehouse. And then they have like a spreadsheet that tracks who owns what, how many are theirs, how many are mine, how many are yours, whoever else. Um, what they told me is that, so like if I sent in, if I send in a base set Weedle six months ago, which I, I, I might have, I don't even know. <laughs> I, I might have one there. If I recalled it tomorrow, chances are I'm not, not going to get the same one back. They didn't tell me what the value is, but they said at a certain value tier, certain items do get like, like there is a catch them all collectibles area for my higher end stuff. Like I, I just actually recently sent in some Team Rocket first edition packs. I have some Fossil first edition packs there. My guess is that those items that are a few hundred dollars a piece, they're probably in their own space because like theoretically, say those packs ended up being resealed or something they want to trace it back to me. Mm -hmm. If, if, if someone were to send in and then they get pooled with a bunch of other people and then they had issues with that. Yeah. They're not going to want, they're not going to like allow that to get diluted across other product on, on high value stuff. So it was interesting to hear that like, yeah, cheap stuff is pooled together. The more expensive stuff is, is segregated. 
So that that is interesting. I'd I'd love to get a behind the scenes tour. Yeah, of, I'm hoping that facility. I'm hoping over the the years I can really build up a decent uh, a decent thing there, and maybe someday I'll get my own. I hope I can build up my YouTube pretty decent too. Maybe I'll get a discount code and and be able to go on a tour someday. <laughs> that would be nice. That would be nice. My my other issue with uh, Troll and Toad, not not that I have ton of issues with them. I I, I really do like them, but uh, since since we're talking about it, um, the only other issue that I have with them is their storage fees. It doesn't sound like much in the beginning. It's a, it's a, like a third of a cent per card. But when you really sit down to think about it, I have I have right around 20,000 cards there and I'm paying 45 bucks a month. So again, does 45 bucks a month doesn't doesn't sound too too bad. But when you actually think about it, 20,000 cards, they probably have those cards sitting in four or five monster boxes. And I'm paying $45 a month to have four or five monster boxes of space. The that biggest, seems a little excessive. And, the but then you can thing is like this disincentivizing people just storing like a bunch of trash with them. That's the biggest thing, I think. That is true. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Because if you get your monthly sales up big enough, I mean, I'm storing, I have 48,000 items and most of those are single cards, but some of those are like dice. Some amount of those are sleeves. Some amount of those are ETBs, booster boxes, collection, but whatever. But I have 48,000 individual items there and I store them for free. (laughs) (laughs) But then the... Like the bigger items, like ETVs and all that stuff, those seem dirt cheap to store there. Ten cents. I, a piece. I forget. I forget what they. Uh, I forget what they. I don't know what they charge, but uh, it's ten cents a piece for. I think they call them like oversized items. So, okay. booster packs, sleeve packs from the ETBs, things like that, all get the third of a cent. Mm-hmm. Um, ETBs, booster boxes, collection boxes get the ten cents, even. And you talked about this before. I forget if it was with me or on the podcast, but like the pins that you got off Rusty. Oh yeah. I think they classified those as a 10 cent each item, which those would be crazy to store large amounts there if you were actually paying. Um, but yeah, like coins, third of a cent. Um, but yeah, I think there's another class, which I don't have anything really big there, but I think there's a, another class above it that's like a buck or a buck fifty a month to store like really oversized stuff. Like if you're if you're sending like I know Rusty has some listings there of the 24 count mythical collections from um from the 20th anniversary. So 24 of those sealed case, that's a big item. That's probably a buck, buck 50 a month to store, which is reasonable for what it is, I think. Because Yeah, stuff stuff like that makes perfect sense. Yeah, but I, I think the biggest thing is just disincentivizing people just storing mountains and mountains of like, yeah, I mean, they don't want, like in, in some ways, there's probably a lot of people who have the, the free storage through the credits, like I, I'm storing water energies there right now. <laughs> if you look, if you look at my account, it's like a thousand water energies. Theoretically, they're charging me a third of a cent each. I'm just not paying it because it's it's under my credit limit for mm-hmm. for what I sell. So yeah, I really need to get rid of that stuff for in case I like this month with celebrations. I'm gonna hit my my goal easily. I think. Oh yeah. Um. But like, if we get a lull month after the holidays, whatever, what, I, I don't want to pay to store water energies. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely, definitely not. <laughs> uh, but yeah, over overall, I like I like Troll and Toad. Um, biggest thing for me is I just I just like having control over everything. So the the only time I'll send stuff to Troll and Toad is if it's modern product and then if i already have i do i do 25 copies 
So if I already have 25 copies listed on eBay, I'll send 20 or 25 copies to Troll and Toad. But if I, if I have less than 25, uh, I just put them on eBay myself and sell them myself. I really like the diversification aspect of it and mm -hmm. like getting all your, all your sales through eBay. Actually, today was an interesting day, right? For anyone following social media, anything like that. Facebook was down today. Instagram was down today. WhatsApp was down today. I read a bunch of things on Reddit, certain businesses. Hey, we're an international business. We do all of our communication through WhatsApp. Like we were a, it was a Monday. WhatsApp was down. If your business, if your livelihood depended on one of those three big, huge, massive companies, which that's millions of people who rely on those every day for oh, yeah. income or whatever. If you solely relied on one of those platforms for income, what if instead of a few hour outage, it was a week or two? What if eBay went down for a week? I mean, it seems unfathomable. It doesn't seem possible. But I think like having multiple revenue streams, having different platforms to sell on just in case, look at PWCC. Um, yep, yep. <laughs> they had a nasty break. So if your consignment gets too big, be careful. I mean, you might have a nasty breakup with eBay too. <laughs> Let's, let's um, hope not. Let's hope not. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, that's part of my motivation for it. And then the main one though is like selling cards that I don't have the time to process and do myself anyways. But that's also why I'm getting into TCG Player Direct as well, um, yeah. which I'll have videos down the line on. But I gotta, I gotta look into that more because that that seems like something right up my alley. Uh, like, yeah, and recently in our chat on Swami's channel, Edison, Edison Sears, just to shout him out too, um, he, he recently started his own website. And I know a couple other guys who have their own websites who, who seem to do pretty well with it. And that's always something I've, I've kind of had on my mind. Maybe that's something I'll look into in the coming months. Um, I kind of feel like it won't get anywhere near the, the traffic and any like it feels like it wouldn't be worth it, but I never tried it, so it's like maybe it's worth worth trying and, and see how it goes. I'm gonna I'm gonna give that a shot um, within the within the coming months. We'll see we'll see when it actually happens. Probably this time next year. But um, yeah. I'm definitely I'm definitely gonna look into that more because I didn't know he was Edison was talking about uh, opening a Shopify account and. Uh, he was saying like creating the websites actually really easy. You don't have to know coding or anything like that, which I didn't know previously. Um, so I thought you had to know actually how to actually build the website and all that stuff. So I think I think I'm going to look into that for higher end stuff. Um, all the lower end stuff is going to stay on eBay, Troll and Toad stuff like that. Mm. But for like graded cards and stuff like that, I think I am going to look into that and uh, set something up to. Uh, at least, at least have as a another option for people, people to purchase cards, and I think it will. I think you could build it up fairly quickly. You just have to advertise it by anything someone buys on eBay. Throw a business card with a or a coupon or something like that, saying "Go to my website for ten percent off" or whatever, whatever it might be. Um, I got to get rid of like 500 more of these though, before I get a website so that I can put my website on them. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but no, I, I can see, I can see it. Uh, I can see it building, building up fairly quickly. <laughs> Pokemon Steve's doing really good with his. Yep. And he's in Australia. So I, I don't know if like they're a more restricted market over there and, Oh, absolutely. I almost feel like like you have way higher hurdles to jump over to like do business over there, get graded cards and all that. So for like the few people who do it, they have a lot more work to do. But like once you do, they own like I feel like they benefit a lot because he 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 has a, a captive audience, right? Who yeah, exactly they, they can buy from him and not pay that big fee and so, so yeah, like if you go through all that work to do it, it can really like almost benefit you, even though it's kind of a headache to get there. So yeah, I talk with him a decent amount and he does do really well with it. 
Oh yeah. I uh speaking of Australia, I had to sign up for GSP finally because you <laughs> USPS um they shut down initially they shut down first class mail to Australia, but they recently shut down first class and priority mail to Australia. So um somehow GSP is able to make it to Australia still. So I don't know. I don't know what mail class they use or what they use, but uh, somehow packages are still going to Australia through GSP. So I finally, finally set up my eBay to offer GSP for Australia customers. So you have it set just for just for Australia? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think New Zealand or so, somewhere yeah, New, else. New Zealand just uh, that just happened yesterday or something. Yeah. We're the same thing. Uh, first class and priority mail shut down which hopefully that won't last long because i sell sell a decent bit to australia and new zealand yeah i sell a lot uh, i'll have to see if there's an easy way to find it but like a significant percentage of my business is just gsp in general i usually <laughs> don't look at like the ultimate destination I, I don't pay that close of attention but i ship a lot of stuff to erlinger kentucky <laughs> for sure <laughs> <laughs> uh, well do you want to talk about our another our other uh big news yeah and, and we talked about it a little bit i think i mentioned it in one of my rambles in, in a recent video um <laughs> may, maybe it was in one that's scheduled for next week that hasn't even posted yet but <laughs> vegas we're going to vegas so excited by the time you see this nick will have already been in vegas for over a day i will be unfortunately not well i, I won't be in vegas yet i'll be leaving i'll be going friday so i'm going friday to sunday nick's going wednesday to sunday the big thing that's going on um saturday oh yeah that's where i talked about it the end of my golden the end of my delta species lot by so I, I won two sets of packs a couple of weeks ago on Golden, and Nick and I are partnering up. We're doing some podcast pack breaks. Um, so whatever I pull, he owns half. Whatever he pulls, I own half. Um, I thought about we, – we talked about potentially just like selling one set of packs to you, but the podcast would have abruptly ended – if I sold him a Charizard first edition or something like that. So <laughs> for the, um, for the, 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 for the podcast, for the sake of the podcast, for the sake of the podcast. <laughs> we're doing a joint ownership thing. So <laughs> maybe, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know the details of like grading. They're, they're going to do the, uh, the pedigree slabs potentially for any heavy hitters. But maybe, maybe in a couple podcasts from now, we'll be able to to show off some nice pedigree, base first or shadowless hollows or something. So that'd be nice. Super would... exciting! Super exciting! Yeah, I can, I cannot wait for that. I'm I'm super excited for that. <laughs> we're both gonna hopefully this podcast will grow substantially because we're both gonna be up on stage. We we get to open our packs live on the stream. We get to like do our little shout outs. So I'm definitely gonna mention mention the YouTube and the podcast with Nick, and hopefully we can grow a bit off of that. But yeah, it's gonna be so exciting. I I actually don't know if I know this, but I have you ever opened a, a base first hollow? I bought a heavy pack years ago, and I got like a PSA eight nine tails. So I did open a base first hollow before. I've I've never opened first edition base. Nope. Not even a light pack? No, no. I've done Shadowless Base, um, but never <laughs> for condition. And Unlimited, obviously. Yeah. I, yeah this will be the first time ever opening a first edition base pack. Yeah, years ago, I think I opened three base first packs. I opened one that was a guaranteed hollow, and I think I opened two that were like borderline non-hollows. Um, but I opened an entire... So it was like a, a cracked seal, but I opened 12 hollows, like a full heavy packs worth of a shadowless box. 
Nozard. I opened several unlimited boxes years ago. Mm-hmm. Multiple Zards, a couple PSA 10s. Like, if we had a PSA 10 unlimited Charizard, that pays for the pack set. Like, we, we paid about 10000 for each pack set, so twenty grand for the two. And we've got six shots, right? We've got two shots at, at each to pull off. Exactly. So statistically speaking, we should get two hollows, right? So hopefully we just land them in, in base first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's, let's hope they're not both base unlimited. My my whatnot breaks and my like pack break luck has been crazy. Like I, I bought into Z and G pack breaks. I bought into some of like Pokemon Radar, John's uh whatnot streams several months back. My odds are pretty good historically. So hopefully it's not like regressing to the mean while we're in Vegas getting zero <laughs> hollows. <laughs> Well, mine mine have been terrible, so I'm I'm due for a uh, due for a hot streak here. I guess yeah. I guess recently I opened a a heavy base pack back in June and pulled a Blastoise, so that was good. Uh oh. But then recent <laughs> recently I opened five Neo Rev packs, and that was that was a rough rough one right there. Oh, yeah. I, I did get two Hollows, but um, and then three non Hollows. And one one of the hollows with the jump left too, so that doesn't that doesn't help. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm super excited though. It's gonna be a, a really fun trip. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, hopefully, it'll be it'll be fun. I'm I'm really looking forward to that. I've never met uh never met Steve Aoki, so that'll be that'll be cool to finally meet him. Mm. And then uh, I think, or I hope Graham Stefan will be there. Big fan of his YouTube channel. Hopefully, hopefully be able to meet him. And then who is, I already forget the third one. Grant Narv or Never? Navar. Uh, Navar, Navar, yeah, yeah. Big, big fan of his YouTube channel, even though I can't remember the name of it. But uh, <laughs> hoping, hoping they'll be there. And then, of course, uh, James, that'll be fun seeing him. He's, uh, he's going out. James is coming down. John Radar is going to be there with with Don Diego. Um, Zach Gem Mint Pokemon is going to be there. Yep, yep. <clears throat> and then, yeah, like a lot of the the more mainstream creators too. Like I don't know if Leon Hart's going, but Super Duper Danny, I think. Right, I, I think some of those. Um, I, I think some of the the more mainstream creators will be there too. Mm-hmm. I believe I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see who who actually goes. I don't I don't really know who's going outside of outside of a few people, but it sounds like it's going to be real a uh, big event and a lot of fun. <sighs> yeah, and this th- these were all donated boxes, so this was like going back to the whole dumb money break where they had the fake box initially this is the replaced box and the boxes have been verified too right like they they opened the box weighed out the packs to make sure there were 12 heavy packs put them back in randomized or they're going to be pulling names out of a hat or whatever so um yeah they even they even opened one of the uh one of the light packs to yep so so actually Instead of having 12 out of 36, one out of three odds for a hollow, we actually have slightly increased 12 out of 35 odds. So, and the uh, the light pack that was opened, they pulled I forget if it was it was like a lass or a Pokemon breeder. So, even even if we don't get a hollow, our odds, odds are, are better that we'll get a uh, at least a, a Pokemon Dragonair or Doug Trio. Yeah, I mean, Dragonair would be pretty pretty solid. Oh yeah, it would yeah. be a solid miss. And then, I mean, you've got so I forget what channel it was, but there was like a shadowless box open relatively recently, where the uncommons or the commons were like first edition. The uncommons, yep. And then that'd be I mean, nice. You've got you've got the red cheeks Pikachu. You've got the starters. I mean, I don't know what the pedigree will do to it either. Like we might get our energy signed and, and graded pedigree. I mean, one, like, I'm definitely going to keep a memento, at least some, I'm going to keep some amount of this stuff, but we have talked too. like, if we, I mean, obviously the, 
the best possible thing you could do is get a PSA 10 Charizard. I, I think we've kind of agreed that we'll uh, <laughs> we'll probably sell that on and, and split the proceeds. If well, we well, well we're, we're, we're not talking one PSA 10 Charizard. We're talking two PSA 10 Charizards. Yeah, I mean, two PSA 10 Charizards, first edition, two Shadowless. I mean, <laughs> yeah. The ceiling on it is probably close to a million bucks, right? If you hit everything perfect and and they all grade that'd be, ten, that'd be absurd. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I'm, I mean, the nice thing with it being three boxes, uh, there's a pretty good chance some Charizards are going to be pulled. It, it'll be kind of a bummer if like no base first Charizards get pulled, but it is a thing. I mean. I think there's something like a 70% chance that any any specific hollow will be in there. You pretty, get 12, pretty good odds right there. You get 12 hollows and, and there's only 15 that you're picking from because Machamp, there's 16 in the set, but Machamp isn't in, in the box. So mm -hmm. 12 out of 15, but it's slightly less than that because you can't have duplicates. Hopefully we don't get like a three Polyrath box. <laughs> We'd, we'd have to sell that to James though if we get if we get a Polyrath because that's yeah there we go his favorite his favorite Pokemon right there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, I'm I'm super excited and uh, it's uh, it's going to be a great time and it's it's for a good cause too. I mean, it's all the different charities that it's going to <clears throat> brain health and autism awareness and all that. So definitely. Uh, a cool event and, and a nice cause. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. And it'll it'll be nice to finally finally meet up in person again. It's been, yeah. been a, quite some time since I've seen you. Yeah, Worlds. <clears throat> Worlds 20, 2019 was the last time we saw each other in person. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's crazy. Over two years ago. Yeah. Crazy, crazy how time flies. Yeah, and... Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like we're going to get a 2022 Worlds, but we'll, we'll have to see. I'm kind of betting against it. Just they're, they're still not playing in-person events like to, to get the points to qualify for it, right? So that's tough, but... I hope, I hope they'll keep... They uh, cancel them enough where they decide, oh, let's, let's, let's skip London and bring it back to the States. <laughs> London, <laughs> London's obviously cursed. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping the same. <laughs> that's that's a hike. Yeah, that's a that's a long flight. Plus that uh USD to pound conversion is a uh, rough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, hopefully, I mean I think we'll have hopefully some good stories. Hopefully we'll have some good spoils we're returning with. For our next let's, podcast, too. Let's let's hope so. I don't I don't think we'll have like cards in hand. I mean, if something really big is pulled, they I mean we might they might get super expressed through, and we might have something in hand for the next podcast. So we'll have to see. That'd be nice. That'd be nice. Be able to be able to show off something real good. Yeah, getting the there. I guess it'll, it'll be interesting to see how they do how they do the grading. Um, like if they. I would, I would imagine they'd have to take them right there for the whole pedigree thing. For the pedigree thing, yeah. Like, we wouldn't go home with them. Yeah. I imagine it would. And whether that's included in the price or whatever, I, I don't really know. I, I would think that PSA, PS, like, in, in some respects, that's kind of free advertising for them, right? Like, if they tie into the whole event, if they donate the grading services as like a charity type thing it's kind of like the whole goodwill advertising all that so yeah exactly it could be included w with like the hollows at least from the from the shadowless and base first boxes but that'd be nice so some of the little details we'll have to figure out how they all work but yeah it's going to be exciting oh yeah absolutely i am really looking forward to it hopefully the stream pulls good numbers <clears throat> Yeah, I'm curious about that too. I'm wondering how they're gonna how they're gonna do the stream. As much as much as I love Gary, I hope he hopefully he's not the IT guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, hopefully hopefully they have something something legit set up where um they do a good job with the stream and people are able to tune in and watch watch the box breaks. 
Yeah, I'd imagine like dumb money. I mean, they've donated hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of product to this. So I would think that on their end, they're doing they're doing good work to like ensure that their money will be like well spent as far as advertising their name and all that. That's true. I didn't even think of that one. Yeah. So yeah, there's there's definitely a decent bit of money tied up into that and everyone wants to to spread the word as far as they can, right? Get the get the maximum benefit from their their donations oh, yeah. and stuff. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, this has been this has been quite the uh quite the event in the making. Cuz when did when did they buy that box? Late last, It was late last year, right? I want to I want to say so. Yeah, cuz la- last year they broke a year. Last year they broke like an unlimited box, I think, Gary and Aoki. Yeah, yep. And then this year, obviously, they're they're really turning it up with <laughs> with all three. They should have got a fourth print, the 1999-2000, just to round it out, right? <laughs> well, then, the, well, then you got to get into Japanese and Korean. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that'll be the next one. Base first, just in all the languages. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> that'd be that'd be an expensive one. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah if one of us are able to pull it's exciting that you're opening your first base first product in general but like yeah th- i mean this very well could be my last ever base first pack that i open too just see if it's a hollow like i mean those hollow pack those heavy guaranteed hollow packs are expensive now so oh yeah oh yeah even shadowless i mean i I have heavy base unlimited packs that I'm definitely going to open someday. I feel like those will always be, they're always a gamble. You're always going to like lose money unless you hit Charizard basically. <laughs> but I think that'll always be like reasonable enough that over the coming years, I'll open more base unlimited, but Shadowless and first edition, maybe not. <clears throat> yeah, no, even, even Shadowless is getting expensive and, and sh- the, the trouble with Shadowless is it's tough to find. Base base first is expensive, but at least you can find it. Shadowless Shadowless is pretty tough to find. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, and, yeah. And Shadowless has the thing too, where like there's Shadowless packs that have unlimited cards, right? So that's yeah, yep. That's an additional difficult thing. Yeah, exactly. It'd be really cool though to get like that error box with the the first edition uncommons or something. That would be really cool. Something cool like that. Even even like a uh, what other cool errors can you get? You can get the War Turtle unlimited base. Yeah, that'd be a cool one to pull. Yeah, I think that's. <clears throat> well, I guess we don't know. We don't know where the B drill came from. Could that's that's a pretty lame error. I don't even know what the B drill error is. The defending with the period from oh. unlimited base. Yeah, I didn't even know that. <laughs> well, someone, someone doesn't watch TCA Gaming's channel. <laughs> I wish a big error variant guy. <laughs> I wish you can get the uh, the no damage from uh, booster packs. That'd be Ooh. that'd be the pull that I would want. Could you imagine? Old school <laughs> Pokemon pulls a a no da- Are those confirmed to only come from theme decks? Like, probably not. I don't- right? I don't think it's confirmed to only come from theme decks. We we know what one hundred percent they are in theme decks, but yeah, you, you might be able to get them. I don't I don't know if you could get them from booster packs though, because I feel like the sheets were different. Like you can't definitively confirm that like it's impossible to come from booster packs, right? Yeah. But like yeah, if, no, if no. one ever gets opened, then you confirm that it's possible. But the only way to confirm that it's impossible is to open every single one because. <laughs> anything could have happened right like the, yeah one day at the factory the theme deck line could have one could have got swapped over to there and yeah, that would yeah, be exactly. that would be crazy could you imagine <laughs> uh, uh, but no it'll it'll be it'll be really fun i'm looking i'm looking forward to it it'll uh it'll definitely be the last trip of the year for me um i don't like i don't like i'm definitely not gonna do collecticon uh, the weekend afterwards, and then I don't. I don't think I'll be able to make uh, Legends Expo, Charlie's Charlie's event, uh, just because I feel like I've been traveling way too much this year. Yeah, it's going to be my only event of the year. Um, I intended to not travel at all this year, and my wife doesn't fully believe me. <laughs> she doesn't watch my YouTube really, so she's not going to hear this. But. <laughs> um, 
when I told her I won two sets of packs, she like she does not believe how unlikely that scenario was. Like Logan Paul's last box break for first edition alone went some of the packs went for forty thousand dollars. And we won these at ten thousand dollars each. Like I, I thought gen- genuinely that these were gonna go to twenty, fifteen to twenty each. I was only willing to pay like ten plus the buyer's premium. I was gonna go like twelve on one set, and I thought I was not gonna win. And then to win two, I almost won three. I mean, <laughs> to win two at ten thousand each was extremely improbable in in my mind going into it. And I mean, Scott S M Pratt won four, and he said the same thing. He, he said he was maybe going to try to win one and then he accidentally won four because they went so cheap. Um, <laughs> crazy thing. I, I genuinely feel like we we're getting these for like at or near to like the expected value. If you went through and you did the math, I mean, to buy a first edition base box right now, I think the last one went for like 360, right? Mm-hmm. That works out to 10,000 a pack. So yeah. we're getting these packs tied to the whole event and all that. Like the price was crazy good on these. I think. Um, I, I don't know. That's why I didn't bid on any of them. So I, I thought for sure right, there's not a chance I'm going to win any of these. And with the way Golden works, you gotta you gotta bid on it beforehand to get into the the bidding afterwards. Yep. Yeah. And then you can only enter the ones that you you bid on beforehand so with, with all those hurdles uh i thought for sure not a chance i'm gonna win any of these so i just i just didn't even bid on any of them and uh yeah turns out turns out uh they went a lot cheaper than uh what we thought yeah yeah i'm glad i'm glad i was a little scared <laughs> initially when it looked like i might win three or four but <laughs> then when i ended up winning too it's like oh man what did i just do <laughs> over the ensuing week or two it was like am i gonna go to vegas should i go there it would be crazy not to and yeah i, I decided to do it and i'm just gonna be safe when i come back and get tested and all that and and really distance better from from anybody unvaccinated or at risk that i know so thankfully i I work from home now, so I I don't really have to interact with too many people. That's the nice part about running your own business. Yeah, I like to I like to think I helped your uh, your decision out to go to Vegas, considering uh you're not gonna you're not gonna get your money from my pack until you until you actually come <laughs> and I can hand you the check. Yeah, I gotta go collect in person. <laughs> uh, that's gonna be dangerous too well it's gonna be a check so i don't think they'll take that at the blackjack tables but uh, i don't know i don't know they might <laughs> it's gonna be dangerous being in vegas we're already gambling enough on the packs so hopefully i'm gonna t- to limit if we do well though on saturday and we're riding the high of like opening some crazy packs we're probably gonna be probably gonna be trying to throw down at the the well the craps table i think james wants to go to so we'll see he's he's still gonna he's still gonna teach me how to play craps i have that game sounds way too confusing for me (laughs) i I like i like blackjack and roulette yeah it's gonna it's gonna be fun really oh yeah absolutely (laughs) absolutely (laughs) and hopefully hopefully i'm not broke by the time you see me on uh friday yeah (laughs) yeah Oh, we'll see. <laughs> uh, well, that's all I've got for tonight. I don't yeah. know. Do you have anything else you wanted to talk about? No, I think I think that was everything. Definitely uh, another good podcast in the books, I think. I think so. I think so. We did have back-to-back there with guests, so it's, this is like the first one in, in over a month that it's it's just us two, and... Yeah, that's true. That is true. I th- I think it was good that this one was just us too, so that we weren't like going on and on about our big trip coming up with guests. Like, what are you what are you guys doing here? You brought us on so that you could talk about your own your own thing here. So <laughs> <laughs> the timing worked well with that. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. And we'll have to uh, we'll have to do um, the two of us post Vegas 
another podcast. Yeah, talk we can't about, talk about how it went. We can't let any guests on for the next one because we're just gonna be <laughs> we're gonna be going through the questions and every we're just gonna work in Vegas like wherever we can. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that reminds me of that Charizard we opened on stream. You remember that? <laughs> Uh, so yeah no no special guests sneaking up in the next one that's that's just for us the the post vegas oh yeah absolutely absolutely debriefing <laughs> debriefing i like it. <laughs> uh, uh, well as always everyone thank you very much for watching really do appreciate all the all the support you guys give us really does mean a lot that you uh continue to watch through the whole thing definitely and as always leave comments for the next uh next podcast any questions any suggestions for future topics anything you want to talk about feel free to like and subscribe oh um, I, always, I always forget to mention that yeah i think i said once i was gonna stop but i, I do it on occasion still here and there <laughs> most people who make it this far are subscribed so Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely, absolutely. Yeah, another good chat, as always. Um, catch you all later. Have a good one.